This episode contains graphic references to intimate partner violence and substance abuse. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline, 1-800-799-SAFE. Please, listen with care. In order to understand Christie's long relationship with Gerard, we need to take you back to 2012. Gerard Three Fingers was driving down Crazy Head Springs Road. It was a Tuesday in October. He was with his girlfriend at the time, and that wasn't Christy Woodenthigh. Gerard was seeing a new woman, Tanisha Pepion Sottler. Tanisha was one of three passengers when Gerard lost control and rolled the car. When the police arrived, Tanisha and one of the passengers were found ejected from the car. But Gerard was nowhere to be found. The other passengers survived the crash, but Tanisha, who was only 20 years old, died. Inside the SUV, the cops found an empty 30-pack container of Budweiser and two unopened cans of beer. Two hours later, officers found Gerard. They tested his blood alcohol levels, and according to court documents, his blood alcohol content was 0.09, just above the legal driving limit. At first, Gerard tried to deny that he was the one driving, but later he admitted that he was behind the wheel. He was arrested and charged with involuntary manslaughter. Months later, Gerard pleaded guilty to the charge. He was sentenced to 37 months in prison and three years of supervised release. Gerard's deadly wreck was the backdrop of Christy and Gerard's relationship because after this incident, they got back together while Gerard was incarcerated. They first met in early 2012, but broke up before that crash. And after that, they were together on and off for the next eight years, up until Christy's death. But what happened in those eight years and how did it end up with Christy dead? In this episode, we try to find the answers to those questions. From CBS News, I'm Kara Cordy. And I'm Bo Erickson. And this is Missing Justice, Episode 2, Christy and Gerard. While Christy and Gerard were dating in early 2012, she found out that she was pregnant with her first child. She gave birth to a baby boy with wispy black hair. Growing up, he was quiet and shy. Out of all eight siblings, Christy's son was the only one born that year. So Alita said it was like he was everyone's baby. When Christy had her baby, she was so happy, so proud of him. She just loved him. And she just took good care of him. And he was kind of her pride and joy. Christy and her baby were inseparable. She'd even take him to work with her. She was a counselor at the Blazing Trail summer camp on the reservation. She got to take him to all the activities they did. And if you see in some of the pictures that we had of her while she was working, she had him by her side and all the kids were bigger than him and he was just a little guy. Christy juggled a couple of jobs. She worked at the summer camp and cleaned houses on the reservation. Christy was raising her baby as a single mom because Gerard was in prison serving time for the deadly crash. So Christy was solely focused on providing for her baby. She even utilized her favorite hobby to make some extra cash. She would bake cookies, cupcakes, cakes, Rice Krispies, and have a sale just so she'd have some money. Money was tight, and things were even tighter when she gave birth to a baby girl in 2014. But whenever Christy needed help, her family was always there to step in. Me and my cousin and my sister would go see her every day, make sure she wasn't drinking. Make sure everything was taken care of, bills. With her two little ones, Christy seemed to thrive when Gerard was away. Her best friend, Rael, noticed the difference. She was, like, really good, like, showed up for work, like, was amazing. She pulled her head out of her ass, quit drinking. But Christy's connection with Gerard never broke. 
she would visit Gerard at the Yellowstone County Detention Facility in Billings. Christy didn't have a car, so about once a month, she would make the 100-mile drive with Gerard's mother. Sometimes she would take the kids along to see their father. Christy never asked her family to drive her. She knew that no one would support her seeing Gerard. Alita said her sister would sometimes hide the visits, not telling her about them until afterwards. She couldn't leave him. She kept talking about him, worrying about him, going with his mother to go visit him in jail. It was like I couldn't do anything, like something was pulling her that way. Gerard was released from prison in March 2016. So Christy and Gerard were officially back together. Back in 2016, as part of the conditions of his release, Gerard entered a free addiction treatment center run by Volunteers of America, 85 miles south of Lame Deer in Sheridan, Wyoming. Christy's visits to Gerard kept up while he was there. The two of them were a couple again, despite Rial's strong opinion. I talked so much about him, like he's worthless. Why would you want anybody like that? Look how far you've come without him. You don't need him. Like, you have your sisters, your family, you don't need to go back with this guy. But Christy may have been seeing a different side of Gerard back then. According to court documents, even prior to his sentencing, Gerard completed educational classes on parenting and generational trauma. Gerard had taken responsibility for the crash in court and served his time. Eventually, when he moved back to Lame Deer, Gerard started working at the local grocery store. His boss said he was a hard worker and was a great communicator. He was going to AA and Narcotics Anonymous meetings, as well as attending church. A friend of Gerard's who attended meetings with him said it was clear that Gerard was pushing himself to become a better person, not only for himself, but also his children and family. And Gerard was close with his family. Sometimes he lived with his mother. But by 2017, Christy and Gerard were expecting their third child. And because of this, Gerard moved in with Christy and the kids. Christy's house was painted seafoam green. It was a three-bedroom home near the entrance of the Muddy Cluster neighborhood, not far from Alita. Christy was proud of her home. She kept a meticulously clean house. It smelled like pine salt when you walked in. All the time when you go to her house, she just got done mopping. I'm like, how, how many times do you mop a day? <laughs> Christy decorated the kids' rooms with their own artwork. And with the exception of toys, the floors in the house were spotless. In the living room, Christy had four dream catchers hung up in each corner. Dream catchers that Gerard made while he was in prison. And then in the kitchen, it was just some plain pictures from the dollar store, like pictures of coffee. That's what it was, coffee. Her kitchen had coffee pictures, and then she had a mat by the sink, and it had coffee on it. Christy's neighborhood, Muddy Cluster, is a small neighborhood in an already small town. Christy's house is directly across from mine. That's Christy's neighbor, Rennie Pena. Rennie's lived in the neighborhood for over 20 years. She's also tight with Alita because they work together at the tribal government offices. Rennie was actually Alita's boss. She was the tribal president of Northern Cheyenne, the top elected authority figure of the tribe. But beyond her tribal duties, Rennie is kind of a classic watchful grandmother. She has gray hair and a pixie cut and is usually wearing native beaded jewelry. She's short in stature, but fearless. Always keeping an eye on what's going on around her. Our neighborhoods aren't that safe as they used to be. You know, you have to tell your children, stay in the yard. There's cars that zoom by really fast and don't take caution to the children. You got to tell them, don't stay out late at night, you know. Rennie lived across the street, and she didn't only know Christy, she knew Gerard. They were longtime family friends. He was saying, Auntie, I'm doing this or doing that. And I'm like, good job, stay focused and stay on the right path, stay sober and stuff like that, you know, encouragement. He was always respectful to me because of the relationship. I've never had any serious encounter with him. Rennie would see Christy and Gerard's kids all the time because they would run around with her grandchildren. 
The kids would be the main ones that would be playing outside. Christy and her husband would be out every once in a while, but not too much. But I knew she was real good to her kids. She loved them. And from time to time, she would see Christy at church with the kids and Gerard's mother. From the outside, Christy's life looked normal, safe. They were private people, so they never really came out a lot. And if they did, it would be getting in their vehicles or leaving or whatever. But sometimes I'd pull over when I was leaving. He'd be standing out. I would mention to him to behave and you guys need to stay sober, you know. He'd be like, yeah, yeah, shaking his head. Rennie wanted the best for Christy and Gerard. But it's hard to know what goes on behind closed doors. Not long after Gerard got out of treatment, Gerard and Christy started drinking again. I'd hear their drinking, and when I say drinking, I mean like bottles of whiskey, not beer. It was whiskey. And they would just drink, pass out, get up, go get another bottle, and they'd just keep drinking all weekend until they ran out of money or until it was time to go back to work. And drinking at the house meant that Gerard was violating his parole from his previous crash sentencing. Court documents show that Gerard violated his release agreement at least 11 times between 2016 and 2018. For everything from failure to call his probation officer and consumption of alcohol to testing positive for meth. Because of this, he was sentenced to 90 days in prison. Those violations brought Gerard and Christie's drinking into the light. Their families would do their best to try and intervene to help Gerard and Christie sober up, not just to protect them, but to protect their children. Alita would switch off taking care of the kids with Gerard's mother, who lived a few miles away. She would go get the kids back and message me and say, hey, they're drinking. I took the kids. and It happened every payday. They drink all weekend. And then it would be time to go back to work, and he'd go back to work. Next payday, same thing again. With family watching over their kids, Rael said excessive drinking fueled Gerard and Christie's relationship. And eventually, things turned physical. In between those times, Alita, she's like, have you seen Christy? No, I haven't. You should see her. She's black and blue. You can't even recognize her. We're like, what the hell? Those closest to Christy say they started to see signs of abuse on her body. The person who saw it the most was Alita. She said she could always tell when Gerard was abusing Christy because Christy would hide from her. Again, we tried reaching out to Gerard through his family and attorney to corroborate these allegations, but never heard back. Do you remember when you first realized your sister was in danger? Mm, Yes, I remember. The one time that she had called me and when I went to her house, she hid. And then she finally showed me her face and she was very bruised up. She opened the door and went to the back room and she didn't want to show me. And then she finally showed me and I was telling her that she needs to leave him, she needs to move home, move back to my mom's house, and get away from him. But nothing Alita said ever seemed to work. It was heartbreaking to see her little sister this way. She didn't deserve to get beat up. She was so tiny. Like, she was 100 pounds. She was so petite and tiny, and she would fight back, though. She would show us what he did. He would actually bite her up, like bite her chest, bite her arms where you couldn't see it, but she'd show us. Bite her? Like bite her back when they were fighting, when they are drunk. He'd hold her down and bite her. Alita said Gerard's violent attacks didn't stop. It just got worse and worse. She would call me and I'd go up there and She'd have me take pictures of her. She said his mom doesn't believe that he beats me up. And 
send this picture to her. Standing in Christy's living room, Alita said she would take photos of her battered sister. Christy wanted the abuse documented, but never went as far as letting Alita share them with police. Alita still has the photos on her cell phone. In one of the worst pictures, Christy is looking directly into the camera with two black eyes. A deep purple bruise fully surrounds her left eye and it stretches across Christy's nose onto her right cheek. There's a scratch on Christy's forehead and her lips are swollen and bruised. It was, wasn't really scary. It was like a normal thing, like, because it happened all the time. It was like normal. Oh, not again. They'll be back together. That's how we felt because it, that's how it was. According to Christy's family, it went on for years. The intimate partner violence turned into a cycle and the substance abuse only made things worse. Alita told us there were times when they wouldn't hear from Christy for days. And when that happened, they'd go searching for her. She would hide from us and we go to her house, checking on her. And the kids would peek out the window and she would answer. And we're like, well, they must be fighting or, you know, nothing we could do. We'd message her and she'd say she's okay. But there were other times, Alita said, when the abuse was so bad that Christy wouldn't hide from her sisters. She'd call them for help. When she would call us and say he's beating me up or come get me, we'd get there and he'd be gone. Like Then she'd come home to my mom's for about a week and then she'd go back to him. And we'd just keep telling her, you need to stay away from him. He's hurting you. Look at you. You're all bruised up. Alita would arrive at the house trying to protect her sister, but Gerard was still right there. And then I'd go up there and he'd be sitting in the living room. So I'd just check on her, make sure she was okay, ask her if she needed anything. After trying so hard to protect Christy, Alita regrets not doing more, especially never confronting Gerard. And I wouldn't even talk to him because I don't want no trouble. I don't like trouble. I guess we should have. We should have did something a long time ago. According to Alita, Christy was nervous to call the authorities for help because she had so much to lose. She didn't want her children taken away by social services. On top of that, Christy's house was provided by the tribe. And if the home was deemed unsafe for her kids, she could lose that too. Alita told me and my co-reporter, Bo, about a time when the abuse got so bad, Christy seemed to have no other choice but to get the authorities involved. She wanted to call the police for help, but she didn't have a phone. She would run to the neighbor, run to my cousin who lived up the street. I'm not sure if she would call 911 because the, the jail number is 4776288. And everybody knows the number for the police department here. So it was easy to call, but they do take a lot of time to get there. Like how long? Okay, so Muddy Cluster is 10 minutes away, and the cops wouldn't come till be maybe 45 minutes later on some of her calls. And Kara, those slow response times are what we heard over and over again from people who live here. It's a frustrating reality. And you have to know how law enforcement works on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation to understand how this is happening. There is no such thing as a city police department. The reservation's law enforcement is actually run by the federal government. Federal agents from the Bureau of Indian Affairs patrol the reservation, and everyone refers to these agents by the department's acronym, the BIA. Exactly, which means that when Christy or anyone on the reservation calls for help, they are calling the federal agents of the BIA. Alita told us about a time when the BIA did respond to Christy's house after the couple had been drinking and Gerard beat her up. So it's like the, the BIA police, if they're intoxicated, they take them to jail. Sometimes they don't charge them for domestic or child endangerment. 
they just charge them for intox. Like they don't care. Like let them sober up and everything will be okay. That's how the police make you feel. But it sounds like you're explaining a scenario where Christy called the jail number, the direct BIA number for a domestic violence incident, and that she would end up being taken away for public intoxication, which is not allowed on Northern Cheyenne. Yes, yes. You cannot be intoxicated here or have alcohol. But she would call for domestic violence, and then she'd be the one taken away because she'd be drunk. Yes. And how many times did that happen? A lot. And this made us wonder, with his parole violations and these supposed calls, was Gerard on law enforcement officers' radars? There were times when Gerard was arrested, but for public intoxication, not domestic violence. Alita said he would be held for 72 hours at the local jail and just go right back to Christie. The police wouldn't do anything. They'd take him to jail and he'd get out. This happened again and again for Christie. Her relationship with Gerard seemed to be at the center of all that was toxic in her life. Addiction, bad relationships, and eventually, signs of domestic violence. It was a vicious, but also sadly familiar, cycle. The institutions designed to protect Christy were not keeping her safe. Alita said Gerard was once charged with domestic violence, but Christy was a no-show for the court dates. So the charges were dropped. According to Alita, Christie even considered contacting a domestic violence support center on Northern Cheyenne. But she told her sister that she was afraid Gerard would go to jail and their children would be without their father. Alita said Christie would enter treatment, but never made it all the way through before relapsing. We reached out to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and asked them about their interactions with Christie and Gerard, but no one from the agency responded to our requests. We also asked the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Prosecutor for any arrest records, but we didn't hear back from them either. This violent, volatile reality seems like it would be hard to miss. Christy's neighbor, Rennie, confirmed that she saw Christy bruised up at least once. I do know that he did abuse Christy because... There would be times when I'd see her with a black eye or you could hear her hollering around over there. I knew for a fact that he did abuse Christy. Rennie also said she saw the BIA cops at Christie's sometimes and assumed they were taking care of it. So when she called Gerard's mother on the night of March 6, 2020, it wasn't to talk about Gerard and Christy. She was calling in response to a family prayer request. But when Gerard's mom answered the phone, Rennie could tell something was wrong. Gerard's mother handed the phone to her husband. He said that Christy didn't make it. And I was like, what do you mean Christy didn't make it? I had no clue what they were talking about. And he said, she's out here. And Gerard ran over her and she didn't make it. And I was like, what? Next time on Missing Justice, they find Christy's body. I was trying to piece things together. What is going on? Then, for the first time, we hear from Gerard Three Fingers in his own words. Then she grabbed the hand while I thought she was the egg dip. Then I didn't know she was hanging on still and she was f-ing still out on it. Ready to move up. That's next time on Missing Justice. Missing Justice is a CBS News podcast. This episode was reported by me, Kara Cordy, and Bo Erickson. If you want to get in touch with us, email missingjustice at cbsnews.com. We wanted to thank the Northern Chan people for their hospitality and for sharing their stories with us. This project was also reported and produced in part in Washington, D.C., so we wanted to acknowledge that we work from the ancestral homelands of the Anacostan and neighboring Piscataway and Pamunkey indigenous peoples. Dr. Iris Prettypaint, a member of the Blackfeet Nation and a descendant of the Crow Nation, worked with us as a sensitivity reader. She has over 45 years of experience as an educator and is a leading authority on cultural resilience with American Indian and Alaska Native communities. 
Steve Razies is the Executive Vice President of Podcasting and Audio at Paramount. At CBS News, Ingrid Cyprian Matthews is the Executive Vice President of News Gathering, and Mark Lima is our DC Bureau Chief. Our production partner is Neon Hum Media. At Neon Hum, our executive producer is Jonathan Hirsch. Our senior producer is Joanna Clay. Liz Sanchez is our associate producer. Stephanie Serrano is our associate editor. Original music by Asha Ivanovich. Sound design by Scott Somerville. Additional tracks from Epidemic Sound. And our fact checker is Naomi Barr. Thanks for listening.